The basic message that I normally tell folks is our students are going to compete on a global nature. They're not going to compete for jobs in Aurora, Colorado, or even the United States. They're going to compete for a global uh, competition between the whole world, really, and we've got to be able to prepare them well. We can't do this alone anymore. If we're truly going to be globally competitive, we have to be able to partner with the outside community uh, to make us globally competitive. Colorado's a leader from a technology perspective. And if we want to stay a leader, look, we, we, you look outside, you see the beautiful things and, and the beautiful environment and the beautiful mountains and the beautiful weather, and that attracts a lot of attention. And it attracts a, a lot of talent. And it, and it gives companies a good reason to want to move here. But we've got to create a sustainable environment to get them to want to stay here. Uh, because they have to develop a workforce. And, and that workforce um, is easier to uh, recruit from if it's here in your own backyard. CTA had, Steve Foster had kind of tasked me with getting out there and trying to bring industry and education together. I wound up going to uh, an event over at Aurora Public Schools and I heard uh, John Barry over there uh, basically ringing the bell. Well, the key thing, the big strategic idea that we're promoting in Aurora Public Schools is the issue of aligning academic and economic development, which by the way was divorced in my opinion in the 20th century. Bring those back together for a specific reason and to target the Colorado Paradox. Now, now everyone knows what the Colorado Paradox is, but it is where we are the second highest educated state in the nation for bachelor's, master's, and PhD. That's the good news. The paradox is we import all our talent. What the school district was trying to accomplish, which is the charge that uh, John Barry gave, gave the entire district, was to really open the doors uh, to the district to figure out ways to bring in outside businesses, community members that would help not solve the issues that we have within the district, but to enhance the education and experiences that our students receive. Frank had got a hold of myself and, and uh, the team that, that I work with. We went out to lunch, kicked some ideas around, and, and uh, that's where it really, really began as far as this project. Well, I, I think what you guys are trying to accomplish is, is quite visionary. When we had that meeting where uh, Arnie Duncan was there and you were talking about what you guys were doing, it was obvious that he saw that as well. Uh, John Barrio, he, he said, we need all the help we can get. If you guys are willing to donate resources, you know, we're, we're all for it. If you want to donate money, that's fine. We'll, we'll take that too. But we'd rather have your people there working with our kids, uh, getting, getting involved. That's really what is important, the mentorship. And that really resonated with me because doing what I do, my people come to me on a regular basis going, we want to be part of something. We want to be part of a community outreach. We want to be part of the community. We want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Please stand by. If you are the chairperson, press the star key now. Please enter your chairperson. Your conference will now begin. Hey, who did we pick up? Hey, Frank, it's Dave Lane here, Hey, Dave, we just waiting on Christian, and I think we're, we're good to go. When I, when I first heard from uh, Frank uh, over at Chipotle as an opportunity to participate in this, you know, it was, I think I paused for about 0.8 seconds or so. I was like, yeah, de definitely sign me up. Hey, Christian, is that you? That is me. Hey. I was honored. What a great opportunity. What a great opportunity for us as business leaders in the, in the, in the, in the, in the community to uh, share and give back uh, to, to the younger generations, the kids that are coming up through, through the school systems and, and to teach them about how the real world works. So this is Christian. So what is the role that we play? You know, you're bringing relevancy of the industry to that classroom because this isn't just a classroom assignment. That's what the teacher said. This is why it is different. They can give this assignment out of a book. What they can't give is this is how Chipotle does it. This is how MapQuest does it. You know, this is how Noodles does it. And that's what you'll be bringing. I, I recall my own education didn't have any real world practice practicality to it. It was all academic. So my, out, of, out of the gates, I tell you guys, 
have fun with this because this is really how the, how the world really works, right? Like we all are, everything we're doing is attacking projects and we boil things down to solving real problems and actually how do you attack those problems and whether it's for consumers who are using your applications or for other companies that you're providing a service for, it always, it generally all breaks down the same way. And you're gonna contact us by Friday, let us know who the project manager is. You guys figure that out amongst yourselves? Right. And then we can schedule like a, a little conference call mm -hmm. right. between the two project managers. Right. That's what mine's going to be. When you start to think about the roles that get played, there are many. There's back-end software engineers, front-end software engineers. Design is one of the most important jobs. How do you take the idea from the ether or a whiteboard and conceptualize it into a, a document or a vision or a or a, or a concept. When you're developing a project charter and a project plan and everything, it's not a foregone conclusion that the project's going to be approved in the actual business world. So this is, we're showing you how um, projects get to the point where the decision is made to whether or not to develop it. And at the end of the day, that's that's how internally, at least if it was a company, I'm sure at Chipotle, virtually at every, every company that there is, I mean, that's how you actually get these projects done. The conference call, in that conference call, you guys will have an opportunity to ask a bunch of questions and just go, hey, we're, we're, this is what we think we're going to be doing. This is how we think we're going to go about it. And then we can answer those questions and kind of give you guys some guidance around that. Does that sound good? And if you think about it, a lot of the you know issues that people wind up, they're out of work, often comes down to that they're not they're not skilled. They don't have any kind of talent or they don't have an education. They didn't have somebody pushing them to get an education. And then they wind up where they're at today and that's that's struggling. Here's this place right here. How cool is that? Talk about grassroots. He was super busy, but he, he managed to squeak me in, which I thought was pretty cool because it was about education. And, what I, what I like the most about him is this guy's down here in the trenches, you know, meeting with people that are dealing with these issues from day one. At the end, they get uh, they get free tickets to the aquariums. The aquariums oh, really? Like, absolutely. You know, we, we raised some money, too, to help out with that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And where did you, you, t you were in Louisiana, right? Uh, Mississippi. Mississippi, yep. okay. I knew it was in Todd Greenville, Mississippi. There you go. And, Close. And, 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 and so how, you were there for what, two years? I was there for two years. Two years? Yeah. And how'd you wind up there? Uh, I, uh, I, joined this, I joined the Teach for America program, and so I, was, I knew I wanted to teach out of high school, out of college. And mm -hmm. uh, I'd always wanted to go to the South. Was, I thought that Mississippi was uh, the birthplace a lot of a lot of the major social justice movements in the last 50 years and wanted to see, you know, mm -hmm. if, in all places in the country, one of the places that probably is still the most broken is Mississippi. You, know, you go there thinking that, oh, well, this is the place where it's going to be the worst sort of backwater, lack of any quality education. You come back home to Colorado and realize we have some of the same problems. Like, interestingly enough, the, uh, if you look at the state in America that has the uh, worst college achievement gap, so the percentage of kids that are graduating with college degrees, uh, in terms of white and Asian kids versus black and Latino kids, where do you have the biggest disparity mm -hmm. from homegrown educated kids? The worst state in America to be a black or brown kid if you want to graduate from college is not Mississippi, it's not Alabama, it's not Kentucky or Tennessee, it's actually Colorado. And Colorado has the largest achievement gap uh, for college graduates of, of any kids. And so you, it's one of those things you're humbled to realize that you think that Colorado's doing great in a lot of ways, but you realize there are dramatic problems we still have yet to fix. You know, I always use, which breaks my heart, because I have two four-year-old boys who I dropped off to their first day of school today. The data we know is if you look at the population of low-income kids in this country right now, you take the hundred kids that walked into, into school with my kids this morning and you look at that as a population of low-income kids. So a hundred low-income kids that started school today with big backpacks on their back, big smiles heading into kindergarten. The data tells us that 13 years from now, if we come back to see who graduated from high school, 13 years later, there are only 50 of those hundred kids left graduating from high school. The worst data is you come back six months after that and say how many of those kids now are enrolled in a two-year or a four-year college to get some sort of post-secondary training. That number is now 26 kids out of 100. And you come back one more time, three years later, uh, to see how many of those kids have caps and gowns on, big smiles on their face on a graduation stage at a college somewhere with a four-year degree. That number is now nine. Nine out of the 100 that started. So you think about not just who has to go stand in the schoolhouse door, 
and stop 91 kids before they come into kindergarten and say, hey, we just want you to know, this probably isn't for you. You're really not gonna make it in school, you might wanna turn around and head home. No one wants to do that, but also no one wants to be the business who was looking to hire candidates and thought they had 100 candidates to choose from and showed up and there were only nine in line for the interview. We need to take it serious uh, that we have uh, a lack of resources. We need to take it serious that we have a lack of proper curriculum. Uh, we need to take it serious that there is a tremendous amount of jobs available and job growth. Um, and it's what's going to drive our economy and get us out of this, uh, this the, the doldrums and this recession that we're in. And, and, and we have to invest in it. You know, we're a country that, that will, takes action, I think, once we're called. You know, if, we, if you watch the Olympics and America came in 28th or 33rd in the medal count, there would be a national crisis here, right? I mean, we would be closing down schools and saying, what happened to America's talent pool? Um, but the reality is we are, we are performing there all the time in education right now. We just haven't summoned the public awareness yet to realize it's time to galvanize a movement around. You know, exposing or sharing with the students uh, not only the work that myself and my team do, but again also others from other disciplines, be it marketing or supply chain or, or finance and, and accounting, it gave me some pause as I looked back and sort of reflected on my career and how exactly did I get here, helping the students to, to hopefully see that that path exists for them as, as well. For me it's been re-energizing. Honestly, it's actually gotten me that much more excited in the work that I am doing today. I was so impressed with the the hand raising that went on at MapQuest. It was, there was a lot of volunteerism going on. You know, we're always looking at numbers and data and making data-driven decisions and, and, you know, running the business by the books, if you will. There's something really rewarding about just volunteering your time. From my perspective, right here today in the present, what makes it important is that I, as an employer, I need to be able to offer more to my people so that they have a reason when they come into work to go, I know it, why I'm here, I know what it is I'm doing, um, I'm earning a paycheck, but I also feel good about what it is I do. It, Everybody wants to give back. Cordero provides me a lot of opportunities, uh, not only just helping to build a great consulting practice here in Denver, but it's also just staying involved with our community. My involvement in education reform kind of goes back to uh, when I was younger. So I grew up in a, a very poor area in Southern Colorado, actually the fourth poorest county in the whole country. You know, growing up in that environment, um, you know, as, as you can imagine, in, in rural America, uh, kids really don't get a lot of the opportunities that I think a lot of other kids get. And um, that, that really bothered me because when I graduated, you know, it was a small class, but really only a handful of us went to college. So when I did get to college, um, although I got very good grades in high school, I was very, very behind. Um, you know, even things like calculus, um, I really kind of had to learn all over again. And having a good mentor from the very beginning of college and helping you get all the way through it, I think is, is critical. So that, that made all the difference for me.
Partnerships are incredibly beneficial. I think our students understand that now, and what a team looks like. Not just a, an athletic team, maybe not just a team that's put together in a school environment, but a team that's put together in the outside world. And the excitement, and the innovation, the incredible uh, critical thinking that's required, the communication skills, the collaboration skills that are required to make a success, has all been evidenced by these three companies that clearly have shown what it is to be a success. We will see tonight the students' work that I'm excited to see. The point of the game is to keep hormones and pesticides, the bad guys, um, away so that when each level is finished, the, the Chipotle truck comes and takes away the healthy animals and crops. The weapons we created were cannons, tissue, Corn on the cob, jalapenos, <laughs> and onions. What was the most surprising thing you learned along working on this project on um, this project kickoff? Well we thought was the amount of work and the different aspects. <laughs> I know it sounds funny to you, but we don't give you that much work. <laughs> surprised at how many different jobs there were just for this one app and we didn't realize how many different roles everybody had to play. Uh, I just want to say thank you uh, to all the, the folks on the business side who have helped lend your time, your energy, your efforts, your support to our young people. To all the students here who have uh, worked hard to make this a really quality program and of course to John Barry for his leadership at Aurora for being the one to always find a way to say yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are truly transforming education and business. We look forward to handing out the certificates. And thanks for the honor and the privilege of standing in front of you tonight. This is to say thank you, and you're stuck with these guys. I mean, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs>